Praise the Lord. I welcome every one of you to the Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. And the blessing of the word will touch your life. And whatever your requests are, the Lord has answered your prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for the gathering of your people. Thank you because your word will do good in every life today. And we ask, good oh Lord, you grant us all the benefits in the word in Jesus' name. Keep us awake. Help us to understand. And let what we understand work effectually, effectively in every heart tonight in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We're coming to Mark chapter 2. We've been studying from the gospel according to St. Mark. And now today we're in chapter 2, reading from verse 13 to verse 17. Mark chapter 2, reading from verse 13. And he went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitudes resorted unto him, and he touched them. Verse 14, and as they passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. When the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it? that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners. When Jesus had it, he says unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Those are the verses we're looking at today. And you'll find that Jesus Christ continued teaching. At the end of verse 13, it says, And he touched them. And then, after passing through that, he saw Matthew, who is called Levi. And he called him. And he said, Follow me. And immediately, without wasting time, and without being plagued with the problem of indecision, he decided, and he followed the Lord Jesus Christ. And then Matthew, Levi gathered together publicans and sinners like he had been so that Jesus Christ will speak to them and teach them and show them the way of the kingdom. The Pharisees and the scribes, they saw that and they murmured and they criticized and they asked why, how is it that the Lord, the Master, was eating and drinking with the publicans and sinners. And then Jesus brings out a very great lesson and says, They that behold have no need of the physician, but they who are sick. As it was true then, it is still true today, that those who are sick need the physician. And then he said, I came not to call the righteous, that means the self-righteous, the superficially righteous, those who think they are righteous in their own strength, in their own life, and by their own power. I came not to call them, I came to call the real sinners to repentance, regeneration, and eventually to heaven. Those are the verses we are looking at. The message tonight is the immediate response of a willing heart. The immediate response of a willing heart. He called Matthew. He had a willing heart. And he responded immediately. 
they were dividing the message to three parts. Number one, the commitment and concentration of our Savior. Our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, had a commitment. He had a focus. He had a purpose. He had assignment. And that assignment, he concentrated on the commitment and the concentration of our Savior. Point number two, the conversion and consecration of his soul. You see Matthew here, his soul, a sinner, but his soul. And then the Lord called him, he rose up, he followed the Lord, that's his conversion. And then he gathered the people together, that was his consecration, the conversion and consecration of his soul. And then we come to the third part, point number three, the continuation of his commission. The continuation of his commission despite the scribes. The scribes were there to criticize. The scribes were there to oppose. And the scribes were there to find fault. But all the same, Jesus continued in his commission of calling sinners to repentance. We're coming to point number one, the commitment and concentration of our Savior. We're reading from chapter 2, verse 13. And he went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude restored unto him, and he taught them. Underline that word in your Bible, taught. He taught them. He taught them. As you think about that verse, you might be wondering, what did he teach them? Why did he teach them? How did he teach them? And what was his purpose for teaching them? As we look at that, and he taught them. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, what he taught them. It's not enough to just say he taught them. We have to know, we have to understand. When he opened his mouth and began to open the scriptures of the people, what did he teach them? Number one, what he taught them. Number two, why he taught them what was his goal if you're a teacher of the word you'll have a goal if you are expanding expounding the word of god to people there's a reason why you're doing that there is a purpose why he taught them how did he teach them number three there how he taught them you see the what you teach is not enough there must be the way you teach and how it is that you have taught let's look at number one what he taught them we're coming to matthew chapter five in matthew chapter five i read from verse two matthew chapter five and we're reading from verse two we're looking at what he taught them mark says and he taught them and i will want to follow through and follow the lord jesus christ and follow his ministry what he taught them matthew chapter 5 i read from verse 2 and he opened his mouth and taught them he opened his mouth and taught them saying blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven he was teaching about the kingdom of heaven how to enter the kingdom of heaven, how to enjoy the kingdom of heaven, how to partake of the benefits of the kingdom of heaven, and how to continue in that kingdom of heaven until the very end. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's what he taught. Look at verse 4. Blessed are they that mourn. That's what he taught. He taught them that when they have discovered they were sinners, they will not gloss over it. They will not rejoice because they are sinners. They will not give excuse. All have sinned. All are sinning. And I'm just like every other person. No. They will mourn for their sin. They will be sorrow for sin. Blessed are they that mourn. For they shall be comforted. They will be comforted because God will forgive them. In verse 5. Blessed are the meek. For they shall inherit the earth after they have been poor in spirit and they know they could not pay for their salvation and now they mourn because of their sin it says 
they'll be meek, they'll be gentle, they'll say, why it not for the grace of God, I should have been lost. I am saved, not by my strength, not by my power, not by my effort or my struggling. I'm saved by grace alone. Because of that, they are meek. And you say, blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Life in the kingdom is a life for passionately following after the Lord and they are hungry and we are thirsty for the righteousness of God. And it says in verse 7, Blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. As he looked at his congregation and as he looked at the sinners that came to listen to him, they were hardy, they were traditional, they were religious, and they cared for no other person. But he said, when you come into the kingdom, he was teaching them, and he taught them. Life in the kingdom makes us merciful. In verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's what he was teaching when Mark says in verse 13 over there, and he taught them. He taught them the way into the kingdom and the life in the kingdom and the vision of the kingdom. Look at verse 20. In verse 20 is what he taught them. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no wise, in no case, enter into the kingdom of heaven. It was him teaching them about the standard of the kingdom, the expectation of the king, and was telling them the tradition of the scribes and Pharisees and the lifestyle of the scribes and Pharisees and the religion of the scribes and Pharisees that those things were not enough to get us into the kingdom except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees ye shall in no wise enter into heaven come to chapter 6 I'm reading from verse 24 chapter 6 verse 24 no man can serve two masters the Bible says, and he taught them. What was he telling them? He was telling them, a divided heart will not please the Lord. A divided heart will not remain in the kingdom. It was impossible, and it is still impossible, to serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot, ye cannot. It's an impossibility. As it's impossible to walk on two roads at the same time, as it's impossible to swim in two different rivers at the same time, as it is impossible to walk forward and to walk backward at the same time, it's impossible to serve God and mammon. That's what was teaching them. It was calling them to a decision. Make up your mind. You are going to serve God, serve him alone. You want to serve mammon and then perish, serve mammon alone. He told them the literal impossibility of serving God and mammon. What did he teach them? Look at verse 33. In verse 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's what was teaching them. He was teaching them the way into the kingdom. Chapter 7 of Matthew. I'm reading from verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate. That's what was teaching them. He was telling them tomorrow may be too late. Today is what you have. This moment is your chance. And if you're going to get into that kingdom that he was introducing to them, the way was open and the door was open, but they will enter at that very time. And he said, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be that go in thereat, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it that's what he was teaching them he was teaching them so that they will know the way of the kingdom and they will take that way into the kingdom and they become partakers of the benefits of the kingdom of God in John chapter 8 
reading from verse 28 john chapter 8 reading from verse 28 then said jesus unto them when ye have lifted up the son of man then shall ye know that i i am he i am he that's what was teaching them he said there's no other savior i am he there's no other voice of god i am he and there is no alternative in getting to the kingdom of god i am he that's what he was teaching them the way the truth and the life you will know that i am he and that i do nothing of myself but as my father has taught me the question is what did he teach what was he teaching them what the father had taught him what the father had given to him and that is what was given to the people and he said but as my father has taught me i speak these things and he that sent me is with me the father has not left me alone for i do always those things that please him look at verse 30 it says as he spake these words many believed on him then said jesus to those jews which believed on him if he continue that's his teaching he taught conversion he taught continuity and he taught going on unto the end enduring to the end if he continue in my words then are ye my disciples indeed what did he teach them the way into the kingdom the grace for living in the kingdom abiding in the kingdom staying in the kingdom until the very end then they will enter the heavenly kingdom why he taught them mark says and he taught them well see what he taught them but why the question is why did he teach them we're coming back to mark but now mark chapter 4 in mark chapter 4 i read from verses 1 and 2 mark chapter 4 verses 1 and 2 and he began again to teach that was his concentration that was his commitment he began again to teach by the seaside and there was gathered unto him a great multitude so that he entered into a ship and sat in the sea and the whole multitude was by the sea on the land and he taught them and he taught them and he taught them many things by parables and said unto them in his doctrine and then it continues look at verse 10 in verse 10 and when he was alone they that were about him were the twelve asked of him the parable and he said unto them unto you it is given to know the mystery of the kingdom of god why did he teach them that they might know the mystery of the kingdom of God. Why did he teach them that the things that were covered and the things that were not known to all the people will be known to them, that they will know the mystery, the secret of the kingdom of God. But unto them that are without all these things are done in parables that seen they may see and perceive not and hearing they may hear and not understand lest at any time they should be converted that's the purpose of the teaching lest at any time all those pharisees all those sadducees and all those scribes that closed their eyes they didn't want to see lest they should be converted lest their sins should be forgiven them that's the purpose why did he teach so that their sins will be forgiven why did he teach so that they be set free from their sin why did he teach so that they will be converted we're coming to luke chapter 24 and i'm reading from verse 27 luke chapter 24 we're reading from verse 27 i'm beginning at moses and all the prophets 
he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Many of those people, Israelites and Jewish people, they had read the Old Testament. How many times they have read the Psalms? How many times they have read Genesis and Exodus? How many times they have read also to Malachi? How many of them had their own reading schedule? That they read the Old Testament through in one year. And yet when Christ came, they couldn't see Jesus in the Old Testament. But now, why did Jesus teach them? So that they will know that those scriptures who are reaching concerning him, he opened their understanding, he expounded the scriptures to them of the things concerning himself. Look at verse 44. In verse 44, and he said unto them, These are the words which I speak unto you, which I speak unto you while I was yet with you. When I was teaching you before my death, before my burial, before my resurrection, when I was still with you, I was teaching you and teaching you and teaching you, these are the words that I taught you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Look at verse 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. That's the reason he was teaching. He wanted the people not just to have a closed book, a book of mysteries, a book they couldn't understand, and he taught them what did he teach them? He taught them about the qualification of entering into the kingdom. He taught them about the grace of abiding in the kingdom. He taught them on the strength of continuing in the kingdom till the end. Why did he teach them? So that their sins will be forgiven. So that they will be converted. Why did he teach them? That they will know the mysteries of the kingdom. Why did he teach them? That they will know that the scriptures of the Old Testament were fulfilled in him so that their eyes of understanding will be open and then we're coming to John chapter 8 John chapter 8 why did he teach them and why is he teaching us this is the reason why he's teaching us in John chapter 8 verse 24 John chapter 8 verse 24 I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins for if ye believe not that I am he ye shall die in your sins he was telling them the only way to come alive and the only way to have eternal life is to believe that I am he I'm the Christ I'm the Savior I'm the Messiah I'm the one the Heavenly Father has sent to bring life unto you and if you don't believe that, you will die in your sins. It was uh, something he made be very clear so that they will not go ignorantly to the great beyond. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, then said Jesus unto them, when ye have lifted up the Son of Man, then shall ye know that I am he. I am he. There's no other person. This one is greater than the first Adam. It's greater than Moses. And it's greater than Abraham. And it's greater than all the prophets of the Old Testament. I am he. And there's no other person like me. That's what he was teaching them. If you are taught by the Lord and you don't get that, you've not got the reason why he taught. He said, you'll know that I am he and that I do nothing of myself, but as my father has taught me, I speak these things. Look at verse 32. Why did he teach them? What's the purpose of teaching them? Verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. That's the reason for teaching. He wanted them to know the truth, and the truth will make them, set them free. Look at verse 46. Which of you convinced me of sin? If I say the truth, why do ye not 
believe me he expected them to believe because it's in the believing that i am here i'm the one sent by the father i am the savior there's no other savior it is in putting their faith and trust in him they'll have everlasting life number one what he taught them number two why he taught them number three how he taught them how he taught them you want to come to matthew chapter 7 i'm reading from verse 28 what he taught why he taught and how he taught in matthew chapter 7 reading from verse 28 and it came to pass when Jesus had ended these things, the people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. He taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. How did he teach? He taught like the author. He taught like the author. And he taught as one having authority. Maybe you had the experience, you are in a school. And there's a particular textbook that you're using in the class. And the teacher is trying to wade through that textbook. And one day, the uh, inspectors came to the school and one of the inspectors happens to be the author of the book you are using uh, for that subject and he saw the teacher teaching uh, and he said can i help you out and he began to teach without even looking at the book and he taught the students and the students said aha now i understand all the time the teacher was laboring i didn't understand and then they checked up they knew his name and they look at the back of the book and they saw that the names are the same no wonder he is the author of this book were you seen in class and because he's teaching like an author he's teaching authoritatively in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god and the word was made flesh and he dwelt among us the author of the word the one that was there before the word was written and the one that is speaking to us now with authority is the author of the word that's why the scribes could not match him. That's why the Pharisees could not match him because he taught with authority. He was the author of the word. He taught differently. He taught assuredly. He taught convincingly. He taught convictingly. It convicted them because this is the word that is preaching the word unto us. We're coming to Mark chapter 4 and I'm reading from verse 2. How he taught them. Mark chapter 4, looking at verse 2. And he taught them many things by parable and said unto them in his doctrine said unto them in his doctrine look at verse 33 in verse 33 and with many such parables speak he the word unto them as they were able to hear it as they were able to hear it jesus christ knew the hearts of the people he knew the level of the people he knew the understanding of the people he knew the people he was talking to and he knew the word and imagine the heart or the word and the word was the heart as they were able to hear it that's why they got it that's why they swallowed it that's why they believed it because he taught with knowledge and understanding luke chapter 23 luke chapter 23 and i'm reading from verse 5 luke chapter 23 we're reading from verse 5 and they were the more fear saying is tyrus of the people teaching 
He stirs up the people teaching. Dull teaching will produce dull hearers. And ignorant teacher will produce ignorant students. But here comes Jesus and he knew the word. He was the word personified. And he came to the people. And he knew that the people needed forgiveness. And they needed the comfort of the grace of God. And they needed the freedom that the word will come to give them. And he taught the people, stirring up their hearts, convincing them. There was something on the inside of them that got stirred up. They said, yes, I see. That's the kingdom. Yes, I see. That's the way of the kingdom. Yes, I see. The picture of heaven is very clear. And yes, I see the way that leads into that kingdom. And it was stirred up. That's why it says, He stirs up the people teaching throughout all Jewry, beginning from Galilee to this place. Let's come to John chapter 7. John chapter 7 we're reading from verse 28 john 7 28 then cried jesus in the temple as he taught as he taught saying ye both know me and know whence i am i am not come of myself but he that sent me is true whom ye know not Look at verse 37 now. In verse 37, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Let him come to me and drink. He presented the word, and also he had the benefit of the word. And when they came to him, he is able to make the word come alive in their lives. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But they speak he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him shall receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Many of the people, therefore, when they heard this saying, said of a truth. This is the prophet, or capital P. He taught convincingly until they began to testify. There's no other one. Here is the one. This is that prophet. Look at verse 46. The officers answered, Never man speak like this man. Never man speak like this man. He taught authoritatively. He taught convincingly. He taught persuasively. And the people were drawn to him in his teaching. Point number one, the commitment and concentration of our Savior. He taught them. We're coming back to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. We've just studied verse 13. We'll come to point number two now. The conversion and consecration of his soul. We're reading from Mark chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 14. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said unto him, follow me. And uh, he arose and followed him. That's his conversion. The conversion of Matthew. Conversion of Levi. Verse 15. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. And there were many, many publicans and sinners, and they followed him. He taught them. They were persuaded. They were convinced. They repented, and they followed him. Let's see two things here. Number one, the conversion of a sinner. The conversion of a sinner. Look at uh, that, verse 14. Verse 14, and as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and 
he said unto him follow me two words follow me it's been there in darkness here comes the light of the world follow me it's been there as a guilty sinner and here comes the god and the lord of all grace and he said follow me he has been there in confusion this work i'm doing where will it end where will it end where will it land me and here comes jesus christ that's able to transform his life and he said follow me he wasted no time at all and he arose and followed him maybe this is your first time of coming to the bible study and you are hearing the word of God, and your heart is saying, yes, that's right. That Jesus Christ is the very son of, yes, I can see that. Jesus is the savior. And then he calls you and he said, get up then and follow me. Come out of darkness and follow the light and come out of your confusion and be converted and be yielded to the Lord. If you're going to do like Matthew, you rise up and immediately you'll say, I belong to Christ now. I give my heart to Christ now I yield myself unto him follow me and without wasting time he arose and followed him maybe you've been following the Lord before but you've come back and you're backsliding and now you are hearing the word of God and it comes to you that Jesus is the only one is the savior is the restorer is the one that can bring you out of what you are and what you have plunged yourself into and it can bring you into restoration if you're going to do like Matthew you say yes Lord I believe you are a restorer of my soul and I rise and I follow you you i pray will follow the lord in jesus name look at verse 17 jesus heard when jesus had it he said unto them they that are whole have no need of the physician but they that are sick they that are whole the people who think they are all right without salvation the people who think they are all right without the grace of god the people who think they are all right in their own strength in their own power in their own endeavor in their own struggle and they think that they'll get to heaven by their own effort it says i've not called to call those people they are hypocritical people they are insincere people i've not come to call them but then he said i came not to call the righteous self-righteous but sinners to repentance he came to call sinners to repentance that's why Matthew responded immediately. That's why you are responding immediately. You are saying, I'm not going to go back the same with the same load of sin I came with. I'm not going to go back with the same blindfold that makes me live in darkness. All that is going to be taken away. And immediately, as you receive him, as you accept him, and you're willing to live for him and live in him, the grace of God will come to you and all the darkness will vanish away in jesus name look at luke chapter 5 i'm reading from verse 27 luke chapter 5 verse 27 he's still talking about the same thing as you have learned before matthew mark and luke sometimes they write about the same story but they give you different shades and different sides and uh, different details of the same thing we're reading about let's look at the details luke is giving us in luke chapter 5 reading from verse 27 and after these things they went forth and he saw a publican named levi the same person sitting at the receipt of custom and he said unto him follow me it's still that's what we read before but look at this number 28 and he left all rose up and followed him he left all rose up and followed him you see when you rise up to follow the lord your past life your past sinful life your past ignorant life your past behavioral life your past behavior you leave everything behind you burn the bridge behind you you know that there's no way going back again i've left all i've abandoned all i've thrown all away i'm following jesus christ now as my savior and the only savior that's conversion and that conversion is necessary if we're going to get into the kingdom of god you'll get to the kingdom of god but you leave all behind all darkness you leave behind 
all sinful practice you leave behind, all the nightclub you leave behind, all the things that attach you to Satan and to the world, you leave everything behind and you take a definite decision and you say, I am going to follow the Lord without looking back, he will receive you. You will be converted. If you are converted already, there will be renewal in your life. Look at Acts chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 19. Acts chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted. You remember what Jesus said? I came to call sinners to repentance. I came to call sinners to turn around. And he says over here, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out at that time you turn away from darkness everything you did in darkness before everything is forgiven everything is blotted away at that time you rise up and you leave everything behind and you say i'm following the lord i'm following the from this point on he is my lord he is my savior all the things you did before that time everything will be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. And then he goes on to say in verse 26, unto you, first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away, in turning away every one of you from his iniquity. You see, each person has his own peculiar iniquity. The drunkard has his iniquity of drinking, and the smoker has his own iniquity of smoking. And those who go on him, some marijuana, they have their own peculiar way of iniquity. Those who gamble, they have their own way of iniquity. And those who are into adultery and fornication, they have their own way of iniquity. Those who are into the world worldliness, they have their own way of iniquity. And whatever the iniquity is, here is what crime has come to do. In the case of Matthew, he was a publican. But in the case of other people, they have their own peculiar ways. And he comes to turn everyone away from his iniquity. That's the conversion. That's what happened to that man. That's what will happen to you. I say it will happen to every one of us. If it has happened already, the Lord confirm it in your heart, in your life, in Jesus' name. We're coming to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17. Acts, chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 30. And the times of this ignorance, God winged arch. That means everything you've done in ignorance. I didn't know that was wrong. I didn't know that was wrong. God is willing to overlook everything. And I pray as you take the decision tonight, everything, every bad thing you did in the past will be overlooked in Jesus' name. But now commandeth all men everywhere to do what? To repent. Commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Conversion takes place. We're coming to John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 11. John chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 11. She said, no man, Lord. No man, Lord. Has no man condemned you? Because the scribes and the Pharisees, they caught her. As if they themselves were angels in lifestyle. And they came to Jesus and said, we caught this woman red hand in adultery. And the Lord Moses says, stone her. What do you say? And Jesus said, he that has no sin, let him first cast the first stone. And they went away one by one. And that's what Jesus said, has anybody condemned you? And she said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. That's conversion. That's conversion. You follow the Lord, and now your life is totally different. You were a liar before you are no more a liar. And you were a gambler before you are no more a gambler. You were a drunkard before you are no more a drunkard. If any man be in Christ, it's a new creation. It's a new creature. Old things have passed away. And behold, how many things have become new? 
all things have become new. Look at verse 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me. You see that? Like Matthew. He that followeth me. Like James and John. He that followeth me. Like Peter and Andrew. He that followeth me. Like you and I. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life shall have the light of life he calls everyone everyone that wants to follow him he calls us to repentance and that repentance uh, brings a conversion to our lives if somebody has been following after the lord before but he has not become a backslider something happened he didn't have enough grace to overcome what came to him and now he's come back what happens is still to have the same repentance and the repentance will bring him to restoration and the restoration will bring him to conversion james chapter 5 verses 19 and 20 brethren if any of you that's a brother that's a sister brethren any of you that's a child of god but not do air from the truth is gone astray from the truth and one converts him the backslider needs conversion the one who has gone astray into Aaron, the one who has gone astray into a gang, and the one who has gone astray into a kind of a community and society that has influenced him and is not behaving like a sinner. He needs conversion. Look at that again, brethren. If any of you do hear from the truth and one convert him, let him know. Let him know that he which converted the sinner, that person that was any of you, a believer, a child of God, he became a backslider. It says, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save his soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. When you come to the Lord like that, all the multitude of sins they're taking away, and as they are taking away, then you become a real child of God. Now, Revelation chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 4. Revelation chapter 2, we're reading from verse 4. Christ came to call sinners to repentance. It tells us, Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, it says, Nevertheless, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Your love for God, thou hast left thy first love. Your love for the truth, thou hast left your first love. Your love for commitment, for consecration, thou hast left your first love. Your love for everything that came from Christ, thou hast left thy first love. Your love for the church, thou hast left thy first love. Your love for heaven, your love for the kingdom, thou hast left thy first love. It says, remember therefore from when thou art falling remember therefore from whence thou art falling and repent and repent he calls everyone he calls every believer that has gone down that has lost the first love that has lost the first zeal that has lost the first commitment that has lost the first consecration he calls everyone to come back to that false love and to that fervent love and he says remember therefore from whence thou art falling and repent and do the false works or else i will come unto thee quickly and will remove the candlestick out of his place except tell me Except thou repent. He wants repentance from everyone. He doesn't want us to do patch patch Christian life. He doesn't want us to say, I'm, I think I'm all right. I'm not really there, but I think I can manage. He doesn't want you to manage a backsliding life. He doesn't want you to manage a life that has left the first love. He wants you to come back to the origin. And he said, Except you do that, he will come and remove the candle 
candlestick out of his place. Revelation, I'm reading here from chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, I read from verse 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou art cold or hot. There are some people, they are not here. They're not over there. And they say, I'm trying to be in the middle ground. I'm trying to play it cool. I don't want to show too much of my religion. I don't want to show too much of excitement and too much of zeal and too much of commitment and too much of consecration. The Lord said, I want to know where you are. I want to know if you are here hot or if you are there cold. Look at verse 16. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spill thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked i counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire this is spiritual it's not ornament that thou mayest be rich that's spiritual that's not commercial and white raiment this is not fashion this is holiness white treatment that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint thine eyes sir this is not medicine this one is grace of god that I would I serve that thou may see as many as I love, as many as I love, as many as I want to take to heaven, and I love them so much, I don't want them to perish. I rebuke and chasten, be zealous, therefore and repent. And those who respond to those words of Christ and they become zealous and they repent and they turn away from their sin, they turn away from their lukewarmness and they come to take the fullness of the grace of God. Conversion takes place. We're coming back to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. I'm reading now from verse 15. Mark chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 15. We'll see the consecration after salvation. It's consecration after salvation. That's talking about Matthew already has repented, already is converted. And now we'll see his consecration. We're looking at Mark chapter 2 verse 15. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meet in his house, in the house of Matthew, and many publicans and sinners, he had gone to call many publicans and sinners. I met somebody come and meet him. I saw the grace of God come and receive of the grace of God. I met the Savior. You must see the Savior. I met that Jesus Christ is coming to my life. A change has happened, and you must have this taste of the change. And so he called many publicans and sinners, and they sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. And there were many, and tell me the rest of that verse. Tell me, tell me the rest of that verse 15. I can't hear you. And they followed him. The same thing he had told Matthew. The same thing he told them. It was the consecration of this man, Matthew, that brought them together to hear the word of God and then to have a chance of following after the Lord. We're looking at Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5. I read from verse 29. Luke chapter 5, verse 29. And Levi made him a great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans and of others that sat down with them, wanting to give Jesus Christ opportunity to speak to them and to call them out of their sin and to call them to repentance. But the scribes and the Pharisees murmured against his disciples, saying, Why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. 
that was the congregation of sinners and now Jesus Christ was calling them you see what Matthew has done that's similar to what that woman at the well did immediately she knew Jesus as Savior knew Jesus as the one the Christ the Messiah she left her water pot and she went into the town saying come see a man that told me everything I did is not this the Christ come to John chapter 4 John chapter 4 and I'm reading from verse 28 John chapter 4 Verse 28, the woman then left her water pot and went away into the city and said unto the men, Come, see a man who told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. What consecration. You see the changed life of the woman. As you see the changed life of Matthew. That immediately each of them knew the Lord as Savior. They said, I'll not be selfish. I'll not keep this to myself. And they went to invite all the people. That was their consecration and commitment. And they brought them to Jesus. Look at verse 10. John chapter 4 verse 39 and many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him for the saying of the woman when she testified he told me all that ever I did we're coming to John chapter 10 why did Jesus allow Matthew to call those people together so he could speak to them why did Jesus respond to those people that came from the city of Samaria that the woman had called John chapter 10 verse 16 John chapter 10 verse 16 all the sheep I have which are not of this fold them also I must bring and they shall hear my voice and there shall be one fold and one shepherd that's the reason why Matthew alone was not the one to get saved he was to get saved he got saved and then he was to bring other people other sheep I have not of this fold them I must bring and the woman at the well was not alone them I must bring, others he must bring. And you are not the only one to be saved your family. You need to tell all the members of your family, them I must bring. You need to tell all the people in your community, them I must bring. We're coming to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verse 24. Acts of the Apostles, Chapter 10, verse 24. It says, And the morrow after they entered into Caesarea, and Cornelius waited for him. And he called together his kinsmen and near friends. He called together his kinsmen and near friends. When you have the opportunity of hearing the truth, you'll not selfishly keep it yourself. If you're truly converted, consecration will follow. You'll bring other people, you'll tell other people, you'll invite other people, you'll sit with other people, and as they come, the word of God will enrich their lives as well. Look at verse 33, verse 33, immediately therefore I said to thee, and thou hast well done, that thou art come. Now therefore we are all here present before God to hear all things that are commanded thee of God. Cornelius had spoken to the we have come to hear the word of God. Cornelius has spoken to the people. They were to open their heart, open their mind, and they were to open their understanding to the word that Peter was going to bring to them. And they all did. And look at verse 44. While Peter yet speak these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them that heard the word. They heard it penetrated them, they believed, they accepted, they received, and the Holy Ghost confirmed Christian experiences in their lives. And they of the circumcision, which believed, were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost for they heard them speak with tongues and magnified God. 
Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we, in the same way as we have done, they got saved, their names were written in heaven. As well as we, in the same way we have God, Jesus prayed for their sanctification and they were sanctified. And now the Holy Ghost came on them, Cornelius and the people that he invited. You can see number one, the conversion. Number two, the consecration. We come to point number three now, the continuation of his commission despite the scribes. The continuation of his commission despite the scribes. Let's come to Mark chapter 2 and I'm reading from verses 16 and 17. Mark chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 16. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him, each were publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus had it, he said unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Uh, here we we'll see that he continued his ministry. The Pharisees were there. The scribes were there. They criticized. They opposed. But all that criticism and opposition will not stop him. His commission must continue. The same thing in our lives. We are to follow after Christ. We are to follow after the example of Christ. You might uh, experience opposition. And you might experience some contradiction of men. But even then, the commission must continue. The commission will not die at your doorstep. The commission will not die at your doorstep. It will continue with us in Jesus' name. As we look at these verses, number one, look at the condition of the scribes and the Pharisees. The condition of the scribes and the Pharisees. Look at that verse 16 there. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eat, with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it? that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners. But what's for their own condition? Uh, let's look at um, Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. They themselves did not have enough righteousness to take them to heaven. The righteousness they had was superficial, and they didn't understand. And they said, we are righteous, we'll never eat with those sinners, we'll never eat with those publicans. How is it that you disciples and you Jesus, the master of these disciples, you are eating with the publicans and sinners? Look at the condition of the scribes and the Pharisees. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 20. For I say unto you that except your right Righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. Ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. They were not in the kingdom themselves. They were not born again themselves. They were not new creatures in Christ themselves. They were still traditional sinners. They were still superstitious sinners, and they were still religious sinners, and yet they thought everything was all right. Look at Matthew chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 13. Matthew chapter 23, and we're reading from verse 13. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer permit, and now ye them that are entering to go in, they stood at the door of the kingdom, and they prevented the Savior 
touching the lives of the people inside there that the people inside could not come inside their dungeon inside their prison inside their darkness could not come out and come into the kingdom and they themselves were not entering in and then the lord said in matthew chapter 23 from verse 27 Matthew 23 from verse 27 want to you scribes and Pharisees hypocrites but ye are like unto white sepulchres which indeed appear beautiful outward they had outward religion outside religion but within are full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men but within, ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Look at verse 33. Ye serpents and ye generations of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? They were candidates of hell, and then they were saying, well, all right, how is it? He's eating with the publicans and sinners. How is he? He's preaching to them. But Jesus will not allow uh, these superficial, short-sighted sinners, scribes and Pharisees to hinder him in his great commission. His work still goes on. His work will go on in your life. No scribe will hinder the work of God in your life in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good, deeper life. Amen. Amen. Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, I'm reading from verse 52. Warn to you lawyers, for ye have taken away the key of knowledge, and ye entered not in yourselves, and them that were entering in ye hindered. They took away the key of proper interpretation of the word of God. And they misconstrued, they misinterpreted the word of God. And their interpretation will not allow them to enter the kingdom. And their interpretation will not allow others that want to enter to also enter. And they were the people complaining, saying, Why is it that he's eating of the publican and the sinners? I pray that those superficial, short-sighted, religious, traditional people will not hinder your entering into the kingdom fully in Jesus' name. Let's come back to Mark chapter 2. The second part now, the congregation of sinners and publicans. The congregation of sinners and publicans. We're looking at Mark chapter 2. And I'm reading from verse 15. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples. And there were many, and they followed him. They followed him. He was teaching them. He had a congregation of publicans and sinners. In Matthew chapter 21, Matthew chapter 21, the Lord talks to us about them when they heard the word of God. Let's see their response. Let's see how it tallied with the decision of Matthew who had called them together. Matthew chapter 21, reading from verse 31. Whither of them twain did the will of his father? They say unto him the first. Jesus says unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. Talking to the scribes and talking to the Pharisees, he said, the publicans and the harlots, the sinners and the publicans, they go into the kingdom of heaven before you. Verse 32, for John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not, but the publicans and the harlots believed him and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. They believed. I will not allow publicans and sinners to go beyond me, to go to the kingdom of heaven, and then I stay behind. You will not stay behind. 
I said you will not stay behind. You will get into that kingdom in Jesus' name. Let's look at Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18. I'm reading from verse 10. In Luke chapter 18 verse 10. Here the Lord gives us a parable that he drew from the situation at that time. Luke chapter 18 verse 10. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a publican and the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself God I thank thee that I am not as other men are extortioners unjust adulterers or even as this publican I fast twice in the week and I give tithes of all that I possess that's all his religion, but not born again. But the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven. And he smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. He recognized himself as a sinner. He accepted he was a sinner. He demanded mercy and forgiveness and salvation as a sinner. He was saved. If he was saved, you'll do like that. You'll be saved in Jesus' name. Verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. The publican became justified rather than the Pharisee. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Now, number three, the commission of our Savior and Prince. The commission of our Savior and Prince. We're coming to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 17. Mark chapter 2, verse 17. When Jesus had it, he says unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, on, but sinners unto repentance. He came to call the sinners to repentance. Luke chapter 19. In Luke chapter 19, Look at the commission of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that commission still remains with the body of Christ even today. Luke chapter 19, reading from verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man, the Lord Jesus Christ, he has come to bring sinners to repentance. And he has come to seek those that were lost. Luke chapter 24, I'm reading from verse 45. Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures and search unto them, thus it is written, and thus he behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. It started then, but it still continues. Repentance, remission, removal, forgiveness, freedom from sin will continue until he comes again. And if anybody is there tonight that has not repented, anybody is there tonight that, has, that didn't know the way into the kingdom, the way into the kingdom is made plain now. Come out of darkness, come out of sin, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, or your past will be forgiven. And then with that repentance and faith in Christ, there will be salvation. With that salvation, you are getting ready, you will get to the kingdom of God. I will be there. Second Peter chapter 3, we are reading from verse 9. Second Peter chapter 3 verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. As some men count slackness, but his long-suffering towards what? Is long suffering toward me, is long suffering toward you, not willing that any should perish, 
Not willing that I should perish. Not willing that you should perish. You will not perish. But that all shall come to repentance. How many people to come to repentance? All shall come to repentance. What's repentance? Turn away from your past and turn to the Lord and say, Lord, I reject, I repent all of my past. I take you as my personal savior. I believe you died for me on the cross of Calvary. Save me, Lord. Save me now. He will save you. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and open the door of his heart, I will come in and sup with him and abide with him. It's going to be in your heart today in Jesus' name. If you are saved already, you still invite him to take all the other vacant places, empty places in your heart. It will fill your heart. He saves, he sanctifies, he fills for the Holy Ghost, he heals, he delivers. It's all in all for us. Invite him, he will come in. Your future will be brighter, better, greater than the past in Jesus' name. Did I hear any amen? Rise up, rise up and tell him, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for everything I've heard. I'm asking, Lord, that you come into my heart today. If you have never invited him, invite him now. He will come in. If you are a child of God, still invite him all the same. And let him come in in a greater way, in a bigger way. And then do greater things in your life today. Spiritually, morally, in your character, in your behavior. Let him give you greater grace and more grace he will do it he never rejects anyone whosoever shall call on the name of the lord shall be saved you are that whosoever today call on him is ready to enter in